a young girl set out to run an errand for her mother. As the minutes ticked by, it became clear she did not simply wander off. With no clues to her whereabouts, local authorities called in the FBI to help. Vicki Lynn Hoskinson was going only a few blocks, but the search for her would spread to three states. faces the question, when is a child old enough to leave the house alone? For mother in Tucson, her eight-year-old daughter's bike ride to the corner mailbox turned into a two-month nightmare. Under the federal kidnapping statute, the FBI can enter a case after 24 hours. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. It would take dozens of agents working in two states to track down a paroled sex offender, but it would take a mother's courage to change the laws that released a monster. Monday, September 17th, 1984. At around three in the afternoon in Flowing Wells, Arizona, outside Tucson, eight-year-old Vicki Lynn Hoskinson, just home from school, was helping her mom send a belated birthday card to her aunt. Because her big sister was staying late at school for track practice, Vicky asked her mom if she could mail the card by herself. The mailbox was little more than two blocks away. After telling her daughter to be back before 3.30, Debbie Carlson gave her consent to her elated youngest daughter. According to Mrs. Carlson, the trip to the mailbox and back would take less than 10 minutes. I sent Vicky by herself, which was the first time I'd ever sent any one of my children by herself to run an errand. We always used the buddy system. Little Vicky Lynn Hoskinson was on her first big solo adventure. According to her mother, she beamed with pride over the responsibility she had been given. She promised to come right home after mailing the card. About 20 minutes after Vicky left, Debbie Carlson was reassured by the sound of the front door. Hello, Stephanie? And a little surprised to see that it was Vicky's older sister, Stephanie. Do me a favor, go look for your sister. Her track practice had been canceled. Vicky went down to the mailbox. Mrs. Carlson told her that Vicky went out to mail a letter but hadn't returned. Okay. Stephanie thought her sister might be playing with a friend. Stephanie goes, oh, I'll go look for her. She probably stopped at Jennifer's house. So Stephanie, the second time in one day, I sent one of my kids without the buddy system. Stephanie found Vicky's bike lying on the side of the road. Vicky! She called her little sister's name. Vicky! She hurried home to tell her mom. Well, right away, that was an antenna for me because Vicky would have never left her bike in the middle of the street. That was her pride and joy. It was, she took care of that bike like, it was, you know, a prized possession. Debbie Carlson drove to the spot with her daughter to collect Vicky's bike. Vicky! Stephanie checked the house nearby to see if anyone had seen her little sister. No one answered. Shortly after loading Vicky's abandoned bike into the car, Mrs. Carlson was overwhelmed by emotion. I was on my way back home. I just uncontrollably started crying. I just, it was like I knew something was wrong. It just was so out of character, something was wrong. All right, when's the last time you seen your dog? Mrs. Carlson called the Pima County Sheriff's Office. 
She also called Mr. Carlson home from work. The little girl had been missing less than 90 minutes, but concern within the community grew quickly. Everybody's reaction was the same, that there was something wrong. There was something not right with the situation. Debbie Carlson provided photos of Vicki to deputies from the Pima County Sheriff's Department. Police retraced her route to see where she might have encountered trouble. Her destination was the mailbox in front of a convenience store near a busy intersection, only a few blocks away from her home. A deputy asked the manager if he'd seen the eight-year-old. The manager recognized her from previous visits, but hadn't seen her that day. Have you uh, seen her in the last, say, hour or two? Deputies also canvassed the surrounding neighborhood. They checked first at her best friend's house. Mrs. Spencer said that neither she nor her daughter had seen Vicky that day. Then her five-year-old son spoke up. He said Vicky had stopped by earlier looking for Jennifer. Hey, is Jennifer home? After he told her she wasn't home, Vicky rode off toward her house, apparently having already mailed the card. As the little boy finished his story, two older boys approached the deputy. They said they'd also seen Vicky riding away from the convenience store. Just minutes before they rode past her, they saw a small black car with California plates. It was moving so slowly they passed it on their bikes. They said it was heading in Vicky's direction, but they didn't wait to see if it passed her. And they never noticed the driver. A slow moving out of state car appearing at around the same time Vicky vanished struck the investigators as suspicious. Although it simply may have been someone's guest looking for a house number, the sheriff had to consider the possibility that the little girl could have been abducted. Authorities take a case like this very seriously. They've learned to expect and brace for the worst. The sheriff called in homicide detective Gary Damers. The sheriff decided that it was important to have the homicide detail handle this particular case because of the disappearance of Vicki Lynn Hoskinson. Um, it was felt that she had been uh, abducted and that uh, we were looking at a case that could eventually become a homicide case. So we were called out a little earlier than usual. A few hours later, a command center was set up at the nearby elementary school, which was closed for the day. It became the clearinghouse for any information, any leads. As word of Vicky's disappearance spread, there was no trouble finding volunteers to man the phones. The calls poured in. Sheriff's deputies, along with hundreds of volunteers, organized a search of the area. They systematically moved out in concentric circles from Vicky's last known sighting. They combed the fields for some sign of the girl. But none was found. Even the dogs couldn't pick up her scent. You know, before you know it, you know, the minutes turned into half hour, into hour, and uh, more law enforcement, more deputies started coming. Uh, 
people within the neighborhood started coming over and uh, everybody started looking for Vicky. A deputy remained at the house should new information come available or a ransom call be made. Hours passed with no word. The only calls were from concerned friends and family. In terms of news, there was still nothing. Still, no Vicky. Under the federal kidnapping statute, the Pima County Sheriff's Department was empowered to ask the FBI to enter the case. On day two of Vicky's disappearance, Special Agent Larry Bagley from the FBI's Tucson Field Office took the assignment. The evidence was simply that a young child uh, who was very responsible left home and her bicycle is found in the middle of the street and she never returned home and that was enough to trigger our entry under the kidnapping statute. In the case of a missing child, chances for a safe return increase when immediate action is taken. The FBI had the power to extend the investigation beyond the state of Arizona if necessary. The agent's participation gave Debbie Carlson hope for a quick resolution. A few blocks away at the command center in the elementary school, deputies and volunteers continued to work the phones. By now, it seemed that all of Tucson knew about the disappearance of the four-foot-tall, 60-pound girl with auburn hair. And it seemed like everyone was calling. Some were pranksters. Some merely misinformed. All had to be answered, filtered, and processed. Finally, among the dozens of hopeful but futile tips and leads, one call held a glimmer of hope. A woman called to report that she thought she saw Vicki Lynn Hoskinson at the mall the previous evening. Hi, can I please she was a clerk at a toy store. She told authorities that a woman in a wide-brimmed hat came in with an upset little girl who looked like Vicki Lynn to her. The woman tried to placate the child with a toy. She paid cash for the purchase, pulling it out of an envelope. The clerk also noticed that she carried a shopping bag from another store in the mall. After paying, the two left, arguing over what to have for dinner. The clerk agreed to come to the command center to provide a sketch. From her description, a police artist created a composite drawing of the customer. It was their first real lead. From the way the woman was described treating the girl, investigators believe she may have lost a child and was trying desperately to replace it with someone else's. While it was reassuring to think that Vicky was being cared for by her abductor, the theory had some nagging inconsistencies for Agent Bagley. It was pretty unlikely to me that someone would have taken Vicki Lynn and then took, taken her to a public place and to be seen with her. That and the fact that, that Debbie said that Vicki Lynn would never knowingly accompany a stranger in public and not try to get away. But perhaps Vicki did not run from the woman because she was not a stranger to the child. Investigators returned to Vicky's neighborhood, hoping that someone would recognize the sketch and provide a name. Give me a call. I sure will. They found no one who could. Sure yeah, thank you. You guys have a good day. A number of leads that uh, identified, or people believe they identified this woman, were um, telephoned into the command post. 
and each one of those leads were followed up by an investigator or a detective. Me. Investigators canvassed the mall, uh, including the store yeah, whose shopping bag the woman had carried. The clerk there recognized the woman, remembering that a little girl was with her, and even commenting that the woman had worn a wide-brimmed hat which wasn't included in the sketch. As new witnesses came forward, all of Tucson held its breath with the hope that Vicki Lynn Hoskinson would be found alive. By the second day of the search for eight-year-old Vicki Lynn Hoskinson, the news coverage was extensive. Local and national news teams broadcast hourly updates. Though Vicky was reportedly seen in the Tucson Mall the night before arguing with a strange woman, it seemed implausible to agents and deputies that if Vicky were still alive, her abductor would have taken her to a public place. Investigators continued to search in nearby rural areas. They also continued to prepare themselves and Vicky's mother, Debbie Carlson, for the worst. I remember them coming in in the second day on Tuesday and uh, wanting access to Vicky's room. You know, they made us close up her room and they started taking hair samples from her bed. They took her sheets, they took her pillow, they took her hairbrush. They took all these things and almost like, you know, they were preparing a homicide case is basically was what they were doing. Um, and I was not real receptive to that. You know, because I, in my mind, this was not going to be a homicide case. Please. Thank you. Despite their doubts, investigators continued to pursue their only lead. They needed to identify the woman in the mall whom a witness believed had abducted Vicky. At the nearby high school, a student thought he recognized the woman's face. He said he saw the woman with the little girl in a dark-colored car the previous afternoon. He recalled the car was a black Monte Carlo. A little girl who resembled Vicky was looking out of the window. He believed that the woman driving was the same one depicted in the sketch. Investigators wondered if it was the same car seen earlier in the neighborhood by the two boys on the bikes. Okay. The Monte Carlo that was seen uh, was a lead for us because it sounded uh, like it had a great deal of potential, but there wasn't much we could do with it. We did look for Monte Carlos and had uh, got no hits with that. At the command center, witnesses of all ages were coming forward. A mother came in with her three-year-old. She helped her son describe to investigators what he had seen the day before. They lived across the street from where Vicki Lynn's bike was found. Earlier that afternoon, she told the detective her son was playing in the front yard. While she went into the house for just a moment, the boy said he saw a little girl on a pink bike being knocked down by what he called a black race car. He said a big girl with long hair got out of the car and helped the little girl in. Then they drove off. This little boy had apparently witnessed the abduction of Vicki Lynn Hoskinson. His portrayal of events rekindled suspicions that Vicky may have been abducted by the woman from the mall. But he was too young to give any more useful details. And his mother hadn't seen or heard anything.
Agents checked the spot where Vicky Lynn's bike had been found to see if anything had been overlooked. Agent Bagley made a crucial find. Something that hadn't been reported earlier. There was a fresh gouge on the post about 16 or 18 inches above the ground, which was not the contact point for a large car. So it looked to me like it was fresh. It certainly appeared to me that perhaps the car that had hit the bicycle had run into this post. He surmised that the small black car with California plate spotted just yards away could have been the car that struck the post at that height. The agent asked if any other investigators had received reports of a black out-of-state car in the area. One detective had. Earlier that day, he had taken a statement from Sam Hall, the coach at the elementary school. Hall reported seeing a suspicious vehicle at the schoolyard at about 3 o'clock on September 17th, just 20 minutes before Vicky was last seen in the neighborhood. He said he first noticed a low black car with California tags driving slowly near the schoolyard. Then he noticed that the driver was watching the children at play. He described the driver as male, with long hair and a beard. Paul told Detective Damers that when he looked at the stranger's face, a chill went up and down his spine. He described it as his hair raising on the back of his neck when he saw this individual. So he kept a close eye on this subject. As the man began to drive off, Paul had the presence of mind to jot down his license number. The next day, when the gym teacher had heard that Vicki Lynn Hoskinson was missing, he believed that his sighting might be relevant. When we obtained the license number from Sam Hall and heard his story, it got me pretty excited because this was probably the break we were looking for. It would take several hours for the FBI to trace the license number to the car's owner. Investigators were uncertain if there was any connection between the strange woman at the mall and the bearded man in the car. Each investigator uh, in this case was highly charged with emotion because every hour that passes makes the likelihood that Vicki Lynn would be recovered safely, it diminished with every hour. Time conspired against them and hope for Vicki Lynn's safe return began to falter as day two came to a close. September 19th, 1984. Day three in the hunt for Vicki Lynn Hoskinson. While the license plate for the small black car was being traced, investigators continued collecting statements from potential witnesses. Another neighborhood woman came in to describe how her child was almost abducted. The woman told investigators that she'd been doing laundry in her apartment building. While she was busy with the machine, a woman came in and tried to lure her child away. The mother managed to drive her off. Police showed the witness their sketch of the woman from the shopping mall. Was this the lady? No. The drawing did not look like the woman who grabbed her boy, but the mother couldn't be sure. Police canvassed the area and found the woman in question. She was a fixture in the neighborhood. Eccentric, but ultimately harmless. 
she was released. Another one of 200 or so dead ends that investigators pursued. Each one meant dashed hopes. Late that afternoon, Mrs. Carlson held a press conference with her family. She pleaded for Vicky's safe return. By reaching out to millions of people through the evening news, she hoped someone would come forward with information on her young daughter's whereabouts. One minute I had hope they were going to find her, and the next minute I was waiting for them to walk through the door and tell me they found her body. And it was a roller coaster. It's like, am I going to be having a funeral in three days? Um, am I going to have my daughter in my arms in three days? Um, is she going to be one of those missing kids that is missing forever? The FBI was inching closer to the answer. The trace on the license plate led to a 28-year-old Los Angeles man named Frank Jarvis Atwood. Agents gave the information to the FBI Identification Division to check for priors. About 10 o'clock that evening, we re received by fax a rap sheet from the identification division, and that about blew our mind because we noticed that there was a prior conviction for child molestation and another for kidnapping. Frank Atwood was currently out on parole in California. Arizona FBI alerted agents there. They decided not to tell the Carlsons until they knew more. The following morning, day four in the case of Vicki Lynn Hoskinson, agents went to the LA address where Atwood's vehicle was registered. It was the home of Atwood's parents, retired Army Brigadier General Frank Atwood Sr. and his wife. Mr. Atwood, I'd like to ask you. The Atwoods acknowledged that their son had committed crimes in the past. They also told investigators that he had visited a few days earlier. But they didn't know where he was now. Agents told them that he might be involved in the kidnapping of a child, and time was of the essence. I'll tell you what. I'm give my business card. Neither parent had any information to share. Agents left their business cards in case the Atwoods learned anything new. The mother was very protective of him, and uh, the father uh, listened to the pleas that perhaps if we acted soon enough, that perhaps Vicki Lynn might be recovered alive. A few hours after the agents left, the Atwoods received a call. It was their son, Frank. He needed their help. He said his car had broken down in Texas, and he needed money wired to him so he could get it fixed. His mother took down the address and told him not to worry. His father copied it and left the house. He went to a payphone and called the FBI. He gave them the address of the garage in Kerrville, Texas, where his son Frank and a friend awaited money for a new transmission. The California office called agents in Arizona, who in turn called agents in Texas with a request to apprehend Frank Atwood. The Texas, Texas Bureau garage. called the garage. Yeah, yeah. The manager confirmed that Atwood was there with one other man. He didn't see anyone else with them. He did not know if Atwood was armed. 
Agents asked him to stall the fugitive until an arrest team arrived. The wheels were set in motion for the arrest of Frank Atwood. There was one more call that Agent Bagley wasn't sure he should make. The, the problem is whether or not to let the parents know that we have a good lead on this. It's breaking extremely fast. We're worried about whether Vicki Lynn is with him in that car. And all sorts of things go through your mind. Ultimately, they decided to inform the Carlsons of this sudden turnabout in the case of their missing daughter. The story was too big to keep under wraps for much longer. They came over b before the arrest was made and they briefed us that they were about to make an arrest in another state. Um, and it was going to be on the TV and basically they briefed us on the situation. Who they were going to be arresting, uh, there was no signs of Vicky, they had him under surveillance. Without any idea about where the little girl might be, or even if she were still alive, federal agents moved in to arrest Frank Atwood for kidnapping. Stay out of here. Sure. Four days after Vicki Lynn Hoskinson disappeared from Arizona, the FBI made an arrest in Kerrville, Texas. Frank Atwood and his traveling companion James McDonald were picked up without incident at an auto repair garage and held for suspected kidnapping. There was no sign of Vicky. Gary Damers of the Tucson Sheriff's Department headed to Texas to interrogate him. He told us that he would speak to us about certain things, and there are certain things that he would not speak to us about. Um, some of the information that he provided was that he, in fact, was in the Tucson area. Atwood's history of child molesting and kidnapping made him a likely suspect in the case. Atwood admitted to being in Vicki's neighborhood on Monday, September 17th, the day she disappeared. He said he had been staying in a nearby park. At about 3 o'clock, he left to buy drugs and returned to the park two hours later, around 5 p.m. He wouldn't account for his whereabouts during those two lost hours. He claimed he was not responsible for Vicky's disappearance. James McDonald corroborated Atwood's story. On the day in question, he told investigators that he and Atwood had had an argument in the park at about 3 o'clock. Just after that, Atwood left in his car for about two hours. McDonald said that when Atwood returned around 5 o'clock, he had blood on his hands and clothing. Atwood told him he'd gotten into a fight with a drug dealer and stabbed him. McDonald also gave authorities the names of other people in Tucson that he and Atwood hung around with. Most were transients. Officially, focus shifted away from the mysterious woman at the mall and centered on Atwood. But Debbie Carlson didn't want to entirely give up on the mall lady theory. At first, I really wanted to stick to that theory, uh, that it was probably a, a woman possibly who had lost a child, was trying to replace a child. And I think that's what kept me going those first, that first week, was that possibly it was someone taking, it would be someone who would be taking care of her. Please. Though Mrs. Carlson held out hope, investigators were less optimistic about a happy ending. When he was arrested and she wasn't with him, the reality really started to set in that 
those last words, I love you, were the last words that I was going to hear my daughter say to me. While the FBI scrambled for a warrant to search Atwood's car, agents and Arizona authorities returned to Tucson the next day to track down the other park dwellers mentioned by McDonald. Investigators found two men who said that Atwood had spent a few nights in their trailer. One of the men, known as Mad Dog, recalled seeing him there Monday night, the night of Vicky's disappearance. His story supported what Atwood's traveling companion, Jim McDonald, told the FBI. McDonald said that he had observed Atwood on Monday afternoon with bloody clothes and blood on his knife and on his boots. Mad Dog said the same thing separately, that he had observed the same thing at his trailer and that they had even discussed that Atwood should get rid of his bloody clothes and the knife. Agents presented a warrant and searched the trailer for any evidence that might suggest kidnapping or murder. Initially, it looked as if the search proved fruitful. They collected a blanket that appeared to be bloodstained, along with a hairbrush believed to be Atwood's. Both were subjected to a battery of blood and fiber tests. Both revealed nothing. Atwood's clothes and knife were never found. The search continued, both for evidence against Atwood and for some trace of the victim. FBI agents and detectives, including myself, continued to search for Vicki Lynn Hoskinson. Um, there was a certain amount of frustration that had set in because we were unable to locate her. Um, the area is vast. It's a, a lot of desert and trying to use all the investigative skills at, you know, available, uh, we, were, we had been unable to locate her. But we continued to pursue any type of lead. Though clues to Vicki's whereabouts were scarce, detectives continued to canvass the park where Atwood had spent most of his time while in Tucson. Agents found a couple who knew Frank Atwood. They also claimed to have seen the suspect in blood-stained clothes the day Vicky disappeared. Like the others, Atwood told them that he had stabbed a double-crossing drug dealer. While that was certainly possible, the timing of the knifing, exactly at the time of Vicky's disappearance, seemed to stretch coincidence. Though investigators now had corroborating stories that suggested Atwood's guilt, they still had no physical evidence and no body. To prove that Vicky had been in his car, they needed to match some hair or fiber from the car with ones collected from the victim's bedroom. It didn't turn out that way. We didn't get a hair or fibers or blood that we could identify. Um, during that time, uh, and even at this time, uh, the best forensic experts in the country were at the FBI, and they were the ones that processed the vehicle. Um, so I truly believe that if there was something in there that uh, could have been found, it would have been found. What agents were looking for wasn't inside the car, but rather outside it. FBI examiners lifted a sample of paint from Vicky's bike to compare to a speck of pink paint found on Atwood's front bumper. The paint speck, just a few millimeters wide, was tested at the FBI's materials analysis unit. The examiner first assigned the case passed away shortly after completing the tests. 
former special agent examiner James Corby would re-examine the minute evidence. Usually, the victim of a crime, uh, you, you have no association with the victim or the family. Uh, and we work so many of those cases that you try not to get involved, but it's very, very difficult when a crime involves a baby or a small child, somebody that's defense, defenseless. And you find yourself, I think, working harder to try to establish something in the case. But if it's not there, I mean, it's not there. But you certainly, I think, take a more critical look at that case, and I think it's human nature. In microscopic and chemical tests, Corby determined the bicycle's paint and the paint found on the bumper matched. Corby also found chrome plating from the bumper smeared on the bike. So what we have here is an interchange of materials. The paint from the victim's bicycle was on the suspect's car. The plating from the suspect's car is on the victim's bicycle. And this interchange of materials establishes contact between the bicycle and the suspect's vehicle. It was good, but without a body, it would not be enough to charge Frank Atwood Jr. with the murder of Vicki Lynn Hoskinson. Authorities braced themselves for a difficult case with few witnesses, few visible clues, and no body. The case against Atwood could easily slip through any one of those cracks. Almost three weeks after little Vicki Lynn Hoskinson disappeared off a street in her Tucson neighborhood, Frank Atwood Jr. was arrested in Texas and charged with kidnapping. Vicki was still missing and presumed dead. Investigators knew that if her body was not recovered, prosecution for murder would be next to impossible. The Tucson community living this nightmare day by day soon learned that Atwood had slipped through the cracks before. Atwood was currently on parole after serving three years of a five-year sentence after a child molestation charge involving a seven-year-old boy was plea bargained down to abduction. The enraged citizens of Tucson marched in the streets behind Vicky's family to protest lenient laws against convicted child molesters. Most wore yellow ribbons to show their faith in Vicky's safe return. Atwood fought extradition from Texas to Arizona. With no evidence that Vicky had been taken across state lines, the FBI dropped its federal charges against Frank Atwood. But state charges of kidnapping still held. In November, more than a month since Vicky's disappearance, Atwood returned to Arizona under heavy guard to stand trial for kidnapping. Bail was denied. And I don't remember the day that they says, oh, you know, um, it will take probably at least six months. And I'm thinking, six months? Get out of here. You're crazy. Little did we know it was going to take almost three years. On December 3rd, 1984, a clean-shaven Frank Jarvis Atwood Jr. pled not guilty at his arraignment. Due to publicity, the judge ordered Atwood's trial to be moved from Tucson to Phoenix. Jury selection would prove long and arduous, taking almost six weeks. But the case continued to unfold. On April 12, 1985, a woman walking her dog just off the main road found a small human skull in the desert northwest of Tucson. We immediately cordoned off the area. Um, the FBI was called in to assist. We systematically worked the area. What had happened was that uh, the body uh, had been scattered. Uh, the animals had actually gotten to it and had 
moved a number of uh, parts around and uh, we just took our time. I think we were out there for uh, five days uh, collecting everything that we could possibly uh, get out of uh, that area. About a hundred people meticulously scoured a 20 square mile stretch of desert. Investigators photographed the entire area to record the condition of the location. Forensic technicians marked areas where evidence was to be collected. In a case with so little physical evidence, overlooking the smallest bone fragment might prove costly. Twelve hours a day for five days, authorities recovered and recorded bone fragments, their location and their condition. Over 20 bags of evidence were delivered to the lab for identification in late May of 1985, including a portion of lower mandible that still held teeth. A witness came forward who testified to seeing Atwood arrive in the area with a child, then leave alone. The coroner found that weathering on the bones was consistent with eight months' exposure to the elements. Dental records proved these were the remains of Vicki Lynn Hoskinson. You know, they found uh, a lower, the lower mandible and a gopher hole. One year later, one of the search and rescue people that searched for her remains had taken a bouquet of flowers and put it in that gopher hole where she found the lower mandible. Vicki Lynn affected a lot of people. These are people who never knew her as the vibrant tomboy <laughs> little girl that we had. And I don't think there are anyone who lived here during that time will ever forget how this community came together because of her. Vicki's family laid her to rest on May 30th, 1985. Five hundred mourners attended her funeral. The community was outraged that the life of one of its youngest members was cut so short. Debbie Carlson vowed that her daughter's death would have significance for the living. I became very politically active to help fight for children's issues. And um, we got a couple laws changed in the state of Arizona. And I think that was my saving grace because it gave me some focus. It gave me a focus away from the pain and the gut wrench and the, the tearing at my heart that I felt every second to I was doing something positive for Vicki and for other kids. That my daughter was not going to die in vain. She was going to make a difference. Frank Atwood was indicted for first degree murder. On March 26, 1987, two and a half years after Vicki disappeared, he was found guilty. Frank Atwood was sentenced to death. But a case like this is never truly over. Sixteen years later, memories of hope and despair still linger. I'll never forget the sound of a helicopter. To this day, when I hear a helicopter, I remember those days. I remember the smell of the air, the time of the year, and the noise of a helicopter. 